Good afternoon, YouTube. Just kidding. Um, I'm so happy that you guys are all joining us. Um, we're here today with Vera Heron and Lindsay Long, and I'm so excited to get to introduce them and um, hear from them today. Uh, my name is Hannah Elich. I have been working at the festival for um, almost 10 years, which is bananas. Um, and I am uh, really honored to be able to be a part of uh, today's session. Um, I would like to begin by acknowledging that we are on the traditional land of the Treaty 4 and that this festival is located on Treaty 4 territory. The original lands of the Cree, Ojibwe, Soto, Dakota, Nakota, Lakota, and the home of the Métis Nation. We respect and honor the treaties that were made on all territories, and we acknowledge the harms and mistakes of the past and are committed to moving forward in partnership with Indigenous nations in the spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. Um, the Festival of Words is dedicated to making this a safe space for anyone and everyone. Any hateful language will not be tolerated in the event or in the, in the chat on YouTube. Um, also, this festival would not be possible without the support of our major funders. So we would also like to thank um, the Saskatchewan Arts Board, SAS Culture, SAS Lotteries, Canada Council for the Arts, and the Government of Canada, as well as a long list of program funders that will be shown at the end of this event. Um, if you're in a business that you know supports the festival, um, please be sure to thank them uh, for their support. Okay, so we are um, going to first meet, meet here from Farah, uh, hailing from Toronto. Farah comes to us as a writer of romantic comedies informed by her culture as a child of Indian immigrants. Um, her debut novel, The Chai Factory, is set in her multicultural hometown of Toronto and delves into serious issues such as racism and culture and gender equality. Um, the examination of these issues is met with reviews calling her writing thought-provoking, heartwarming, hilarious, irresistible, layered, complex, delightful, and brilliant. Um, in addition to this, I discovered through a deep dive into her Instagram that Farah and I uh, both manage our anxiety through aggressive crafting. So I'm sold. Uh, please welcome her with me by silently clapping, Sarah Heron. Hello, thank you so much for that very, very warm welcome and introduction, Hannah. Um, I'm just gonna make my screen big so I can, okay. Um, so today I'm gonna be reading uh, a little bit from my book, The Chai Factor. Um, and then I'm just gonna talk a little bit about what inspired the book and how I came up with it. Um, Chai Factor came out last year, 2019, um, and it was my debut. Uh, and I'm reading from chapter two. So I'm just gonna give you a very, very, very short uh, summary of what happened in chapter one, so you're not lost. Our heroine, Amira Khan, is on a train from her home. Um, she's actually coming back from university in Kingston to her home in Toronto. Um, and on that train, she is hit on by a man who is wearing silver pants. And then uh, a man with a big, bright, bright red beard comes to her rescue and saves her from silver pants. Um, she, in her head, calls the man with the red beard garden gnome, and um, she's not very pleased about being rescued. Chapter two. The moment her harasser was out of sight, Amira wormed free of the garden gnome's grip, grip and glared at him. I don't need to be rescued, she said through gritted teeth. The last thing she wanted was more attention. Sure looked like he did. He grinned as he rocked back on his heels. That guy was a snake. He would not have left you alone. Amira stood taller to face down her noble savior. It didn't do much good. The lumberjack had at least six inches on her. She bit her lip, keenly aware of two things. One, she was an, alone in the middle of nowhere, surrounded by strangers. And two, things that might have gotten ugly fast if Paul Bunyan here hadn't intervened. Did he expect her to fawn over him now? Paul Bunyan smiled again. Dude needed an ax or a wheelbarrow to really pull off this look, but she had to admit he did have a warm smile. Duncan Galahad, he drawled as he shot his hand out, expecting her to shake it. She didn't. Instead, she raised one eyebrow. Galahad? Her unwanted rescuer's name was Galahad? Yep, it's my real name. Originally, my great granddaddy was called Gallagher, but the ship from Ireland apparently had five other Gallaghers on it, so he wrote Galahad on the ship's register. He didn't like being one of many, big fan of Arthurian legend. Amira crossed her arms. She should have stayed in her dorm. If she wanted to be surrounded by clueless men with false chivalry, there were plenty of awkward engineering students there to unnecessarily white knight for her. They may not be as brawny as this guy, but Amira shuddered. 
This tiny one room building felt hotter every second with the heat generated by dozens of annoyed train passengers. The soaring beamed ceilings and wood floors would have been charming in any other circumstance, but today only served to echo the irate voices and heavy footsteps. She looked out the window at the emptied rails. Where was the replacement train? You okay, Duncan asked. She gifted him with her best scowl, the one that made the interns cower in fear when she worked at the consulting firm. You didn't have to tell him you were my boyfriend. He snorted. Yeah, I did. I know the type. He'd keep bugging you if I told him to leave you alone. Guys like that have no respect for women, but they do respect man code. Only way to keep off him is to let him think you are someone else's property. I am not some prize for men to fight over. I don't belong to anyone, she snapped. Okay, Princess Jasmine, he laughed. So I'm Princess Jasmine because I'm brown? No, because of what you said. You sound like Princess Jasmine from Aladdin. Remember when all the princes showed up in the palace? You've seen Aladdin, right? He shook his head like he couldn't imagine a grown woman not knowing everything about every Disney movie. And anyway, I heard you tell him you were Indian. Agrabah is actually based on Iraq, not India. Amira's mouth fell open. A big, burly, lumberjack, mansplaining princess movies was a new one. I live with my niece. She's into princesses, he explained with a wide grin that would probably charm the pants off of every Disney nerd in the 10 mile radius. Amira stared at the man a moment before shaking her head with disbelief. Look, I don't need some mouth breathing neckbeard who just emerged from the lumber yard to save me with grand gestures. He snorted, mouth breathing? I'll have you know my sinuses are perfectly clear. He inhaled sharply to prove his point. Amira tried not to, but she laughed. This guy was funny. Glad to hear it. Anyway, I'm not a damsel in distress and I would prefer to be left alone. He smiled faintly as he bowed with flourish. Of course, milady, it was kindly meant. I wish you well. He turned on his heels and Amira watched Duncan Galahad's broad flannel clad back disappear into the crowd. Finding her alone, Amira called her, ca pulled out her phone and called Rena, her best friend. What's up, Mir? She leaned back on the window. What do you want me to, what do you want to hear about first, Re? The broken down train? The guy who tried to put his hand up my skirt and was drenched in more dollar store body spray than your prom date? Or maybe the unwanted rescuer named Galahad, who's like a cross between a brave knight and Paul Bunyan. Rena laughed. What the hell happened? I thought you were taking the bus down. Where are you? Port Hope. I splurged on a train ticket, but there were technical problems. I thought the train would be more civilized. It isn't. Oh, God, Amir, are you stuck there? No, apparently a new train is on its way. I should have splurged for first class. First class doesn't actually mean classier people. No, but it does mean open bar. Rena was Amira's oldest and closest friend, and life was going to get a whole lot better once Amira was back to living in the same city as Rena. They'd known each other since grade two, when a wide-eyed Rena nervously walked into Amira's classroom as the new transfer student. Amira had been ecstatic to have another brown girl in class. And when Rena showed up on Friday night as the new girl in Jamaat Khanna, the smiley Muslim place of worship, Amira had found a soulmate. No one knew her like Rena did. She could always be counted on for support, but she never held back from calling Amira out on her shit. Rena had siblings, but Amira had been an only child until she was 19, and Rena had filled the sibling gap in her life. She told her friend about the events about the events of the last few hours, downplaying the situation with silver pants and embellishing her description of the garden gnome and his chivalrous bow. Rena had a lot going on lately, and she deserved a laugh. Green eyes and a red beard? Is the lumberjack hot? Rena asked. Amira thought about Duncan's strong forearms and broad back. Picture an overgrown garden gnome with a regular gym habit. Brave Sir Galahad saved you from the evil villain. It's utterly romantic, the perfect meat cute. Amira bit her tongue. Rena was hopelessly ad addicted to romantic comedies and spent altogether too much time preoccupied with, with Amira's non-existent love life. Amira was certain it was to deflect attention from Rena's own dating woes. Brave Sir Lumberjack is not my type. He may not be an ass like silver pants, but anyway, I'm not on this train to pick up men. Thank you. Okay, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the book now. Um, in case you feel like feel like picking it up, um, I will give you a hint of what happens next. Brave Sir Lumberjack, Duncan, ends up in her basement when she gets home because he, his, her grandmother has rented the basement apartment out to him and his barbershop quartet. Okay. So thank you so much to the Saskatchewan Festival of Words for inviting me to speak today. I literally squealed when my publicist asked me to do this event. It, I've never been to Saskatchewan. It's been on my bucket list for years, but as you know, plans kind of changed. I'm still happy to be here, even though I'm not really in Saskatchewan, but rather in my house in Toronto. 
I find it really hard to talk about my debut novel, The Shy Factor, which is weird because it wasn't hard to write. In fact, no other book I've written has been anywhere near as easy as it was. Maybe it's hard to talk about it because I already put everything in I had to say in the book. Seriously, I put everything in the book. One review that I particularly loved called the book Gorgeously Layered. I was thrilled when I read that. That's exactly what I tried to do, layer in as many storylines and characters as I could in 96,000 words. I put all the things that I wanted to see more of in my book. Fighting the patriarchy, that's in there. Close-knit, often intrusive families, yep. Descriptions of the most mouth-watering, home-cooked Indian food, absolutely. Mentions of the music I grew up with, including a healthy dose of CanCon, as well as some of my favorite new wave musicians like Depeche Mode and David Bowie, yes. I even squeezed in the suggestion of spandex singing costumes and drunken midnight snacks. The Chai Factor has it all, a romantic comedy about an engineer and the baritone in a, bar in a barbershop quartet. It's full of laughs and so much love. It's silly and at, at times irreverent, and I think it's uplifting. When I set out to write the book, my only goal was to write my first romantic comedy about a Muslim Canadian woman, a romance novel. That sounds simple enough, but maybe it's actually revolutionary. You all know what people think when they hear rom-coms. Some disparage anything with the word romance in it. Some think comedy is a lowbrow art form that anyone can do. By the way, those that, can, those that say that usually can't. And others are incapable of saying anything positive about something made primarily for and by women. I don't like fluff, people tell me. Or I like books with substance. Romance novels are all trashy. In the tri factors, in between the layers of academic stress, a cappella music appreciation, found family support, and workplace drama, there is a layer about fighting intolerance. At its core, it's a story about learning to fight hatred without letting that hatred take you down. It's about navigating this difficult world as a woman of color, as a Muslim, and as a person who just wants to get through her day and not deal with a society that sees her as what she is instead of who she is. And most of all, it's a story about the amazing, joyful, life-altering act of falling in love. I don't think that's fluff at all. A funny thing happens when you fall in love, especially when you're not looking for it, which Amira, the heroine in The Chai Factor, most definitely is not looking for it. When you lower your walls enough to let someone in your heart, your mind, and your life, the way you see your world changes. As you begin to see through the eyes of another person, your perspective shifts just a tiny bit. In our modern world, seeing through the eyes of a different perspective to shift our worldview is extra important. And breaking down walls and letting marginalized people love who they want, how they want, and giving them the big joyful romances, even in books, is essential. Everyone is entitled to the happily ever after, even a cranky, burnt out Muslim engineer like Amira. Here in Canada, we're lucky enough to be surrounded by different perspectives. We have access to so much if we let it in. And that's the other thing I set out to do. I wanted to write a quintessentially Canadian story. I was born near Toronto and have lived here my whole life. English is my first language, but I can speak grade nine French pretty well. You know, je suis tu es, il est. I learned to skate before learning to swim. I've owned both a canoe and a kayak. I've seen the Tragically Hip live over five times, and I'm raising two children who know what butter tarts are, Nanaimo bars, and poutine. I'm also a Muslim. I'm the child of immigrants. I'm a woman of color. My homemade biryani rivals any restaurant in Little India. And I married my own white small town hero in a mosque. That's the real Canada, or at least what we should strive to be, diverse, accepting, compassionate, cooperative, and home to some of the best food from around the world than I've had anywhere. I wanted that Canada represented in my books. In the end, the book that was so easy to write was because I let it be more than what I wanted it to be. And, in, and it appears that I should talk about it the same way I wrote it, layer in everything and hope something resonates with someone. To end with one of my favorite quotes about The Chai Factor from CBC Books, The Chai Factor is a romantic comedy about opposites colliding and about how little inconveniences can become life-changing if you open up. And finally, I should probably talk about my next book, Accidentally Engaged, will be released March 9th, 2021 by Forever Grand Central Books. It's another rom-com, and once again, I put everything in it. An arranged marriage, a fake engagement, a TV cooking contest, lots and lots of bread. And two brown Muslims, one an immigrant and the other the child of immigrants, finding love with the odds stacked against them. Revolutionary. Thank you. Thank you so much, Farah. Um, I am also, I would just like to say, really honored to be leading um, this 
session um, featuring two women of color. I think that um, hearing voices, and because you two both focus so much on on your culture in your writing, and I that's what I love about um, about I I just love reading about other people's cultures to open my my awareness of the human experience, which I'm now just quoting from my introduction of Lindsay. So uh, we next have Lindsay Wong. Um, I really love creative nonfiction, particularly memoir. Um, I love hearing stories that broaden my understanding of different cultures and more broadly the human experience. Uh, Lindsay very much delivers with the woo woo, how I survived ice hockey, drug raids, demons, and my crazy Chinese family. Congrats, by the way, on getting that tagline by your publishers. <laughs> um, this book tells stories about her Chinese Canadian families, Chinese Canadian families history with mental illness. Um, this book was selected for the 29th edition of Canada Reads, long listed for the Stephen Laycock uh, Memorial Medal, shortlisted for the Hillary Weston Writers Trust Prize, and was the winner of the Hubert Evans Nonfiction Prize. Endless publications included as among the best books of the year, and critics cannot stop with their description of, of her writing as heart-wrenching, batshit insane, witty, touching, raw, funny, profane, rich with gritty, hard-earned insight as Lindsay presents the shaky reality of living across two cultures and offers a difficult, tenuous bridge between these worlds. That was a full review, that one. The Arsenal Paul wrote that, not me. Um, with that, Let's welcome silently again, Lindsay Wong. Thank you so much. Um, thanks, Hannah, for that lovely introduction and Saskatchewan uh, for having me. Farah, that was amazing reading and speech. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to read a few excerpts um, from the Woo Woo. And then I'm going to end with something fun and light and summary um, from my YA novel. So there's a little bit of everything for everyone. Okay. My mother's delusions started early one morning. It all began as she'd fumbled for baby formula in the pantry at my brother's feeding time. She later told me the next morning that there had been a hot, staticky voice in her head that seemed to possess her. Look over here, the voice had demanded and my mother's eyeballs and neck robotically swiveled to the doorway as if by pure fanatic sorcery. You're okay, the voice reassured her. You're going to be absolutely a-okay. Lindsay, it was an alien or a ghost, she wailed, grabbing my shoulders. It took possession of my brain and body. Too young to understand. I shrugged her off and walked away, but I wanted to know why we weren't happy or even nice to one another, like the Flintstones or the Jetsons on Saturday morning television. This was the first hallucinatory vision that made her insist she had played host to the woo-woo. They came here right into the kitchen and hugged me, she continued, clutching her belly, following me to the kitchen where I was searching for leftover Halloween candy for breakfast. Oh my God. Then the ghost or aliens put fire in my body and gave me magical powers. So everyone in our family has to listen to me from now on. Okay, I said, wanting to show her that I had heard her. But does that mean I can have more chocolate? Unfortunately, in our large Chinese family, mental health was not a strong suit. I had a grandmother who had been diagnosed with serious paranoid schizophrenia, who everyone said was mentally weak or suffered from embarrassing extrasensory perception, AKA fucked up ESP. Too many of us were inclined to nervous breakdowns, mainly in exciting psychotic installments. And many years later, when I was 20 years old, on Canada Day 2008, my auntie beautiful one, the youngest of my mom's five sisters, would take the city of Vancouver hostage, trapping more than 200,000 people as she threatened to leap off the Iron Workers Memorial Bridge. According to what I would now describe as 17th century Chinese psychobabble, it was thought that we were somehow more prone than other people to demonic possession. This wisdom, said to be common knowledge, was superstitious folklore that my family wholly believed in. 
it was a standard practice, like brushing your teeth, which had been handed down by my ancestors and perpetrated among our clan. My family was so mistrustful of all breeds of outsiders and North American newspapers, choosing to champion instead rambling phone gossip and ancient bullshit tradition. Ay ya, if you have the shit gas, go outside and hit yourself 50 times in the ass with a bamboo stick and it will go away. Fever? No problem. Run around in the snow, naked. Later, when I was in high school and briefly took psychology as elective, I saw my mother's picture next to a definition of psychotic delusions. But of course, there was no mention of the woo-woo whose foul moods ruled our household. Our family insisted that supernatural outcasts charted our bodies because we were born with watery minds and squishy hearts, which meant that anything dead could rent us for free. Randomly leaping inside us, these ghostly villains rotated among their hosts at least once a week. It's in the DNA and cultural beliefs of almost every village Chinese family to think ghosts, guai, are haunting them every so often, especially if a new baby is born exceptionally ugly or someone gets a shocking grade on the SAT. But our family's woo-woo was the most horror-worthy and innovative. As a kid, unlike my mother, aunties, and grandmother, I did not have this particular superpower, and upon finding out that my mother was in terrible trouble and not entirely understanding the consequences, I desperately wanted to belong. No matter how hard I tried, or how much I peeked inside cupboards and closets, I could not see a single ghost. As a small child, not having the woo-woo power was like not being invited to a birthday party whose host you detested, yet everyone you knew had been invited and came back raving about the laser tag and the seven layer ice cream cake. Even though my parents' fights scared me as a child, I also found the brand of crazy fascinating, like a car wreck. I couldn't look away. And with this other excerpt, um, I hope everyone had their lunch already. Um, if not, you don't have to listen. I'm gonna talk about parasites. My mother had survived third world poverty in what had once been the rural outskirts of Hong Kong. Her grandfather's prosperous merchant family had sold their schizophrenic daughter, my grandmother, to a poor man for just a hundred bucks before jumping ship to Hong Coover. Not only had my grandmother been cut off from the family fortune, but she had basically been abandoned in a backwater village to run around barefoot and being famously crazy. So my mother and her siblings had grown up with nothing to eat, but all the cigarettes they cared to smoke. Gung Gung, my grandfather, doled out economy packs like candy because he got them for free with his gambling win or lose. I imagined my mother and my aunties and uncles as toddlers squatting in ankle deep mud, chubby black flies chewing the thick grease off their sculpts, smoking cigarettes, having a blast. Because as soon as you turned two years old, Gung Gung proudly handed you your very own pack to help with the hunger. When they were lucky enough to buy a whole chicken, only the boys could partake in the skimpy meal. And I imagined my mother as a kid, sulkily huffing and puffing on her cigarettes all day long as she watched her brothers gorge on fresh meat. Each of the eight kids had a favorite sibling or someone they felt a little sorry for. My mother looked out for my aunt, who was six years younger. She was responsible for plucking lice out of Beautiful One's thick, horsey hair, and when Beautiful One was too vain to want an ugly boy's haircut, my mother would slap her into agreement. A sympathetic auntie once told me, lucky you, you got the meanest person in the family for your mommy, which was true because my mother was certainly the most demanding sister. In times of famine and hardship, having my mother around meant that you had a better chance of survival. At mealtimes, the quickest or the biggest kid got the most rice, 
through speed or physical intimidation. In those simple village days, dinners were violent world wars, so alliances and strategies had to be forged and schemed. If you are not a blessed boy, the chicken thighs were definitely out of the question. But as a little girl, you could always brawl over a measly gizzard or bleeding poultry heart. My mother shared her dinner organs with my aunt, and sometimes she did not eat. This was a compassionate side of my mother that I had never seen, and it seemed that it slowly leaked out, like battery acid, during her marriage to my father, who had a selfishly polarizing effect on her. It was almost as if she had to hide any slivers of kind-heartedness from my father to avoid being discovered for what she really was or what she could be. Show a little self-sacrificing compassion and my father might mock you. Then a nasty ghost would take possession of you. At dinner parties, when the aunties and uncles talked about the old days, they loved to compare the exact size and length of their parasites. Supposedly, these are dangling snakes that they had to pluck out from their assholes, and my mother always bragged about her squiggling cobra being four feet long, where his beautiful one said hers was a beast at six feet. They could spend hours arguing over whose monster worm was scarier, which one was hairier, whose had a googly eye. And I assume that because they had nothing to focus on back then, except their miserable poverty, this is what they discussed the past few hours as they happily puffed a pack a day. The dimensions and forms of these mythological serpents have been discussed to death. The siblings all complained about their terrible childhood hunger. To reassure themselves that a food shortage did not exist anymore, they ordered in dozens of cardboard pizzas, soggy boxes of saturated fried chicken, and entire menus from the greasy spoons for Lunar New Year, the sweet and sour pork bleeding a vicious celebratory red, the black fermented fish heads tossed in maggoty fried rice, everything and anything ordered to make up for not eating when they were children. Of course, all the cousins had lost their appetites by now, and we stared at the foot-long slimy rice noodles, the caterpillar-like vermicelli coagulating in sludgy sauce with queasy, unspeakable horror. So after writing the woo-woo, um, when an editor, it's Simon Pulse, asked me if I wanted to write a YA novel, I was like, yes, anything um, except memoir. I'll, I'll try anything. And um, my summer of love and misfortune was born. And um, it's a very light, um, summary read. It's very, very different than Woo Woo. And it follows the misadventures of a 17 year old Iris Wang. I'm just going to read a little bit from the first chapter. One Flower Heart. I, Iris Wang, was born to be unlucky. This is because I was born in the year of the tiger, and everyone in our Chinese family knows that girls born in tiger year are bad luck. A flower-hearted tiger girl such as yours truly means that I'm destined to pick loser boys and never listen to my parents. A flower heart is someone who shows up hungover to her SATs and half-asses her college admissions essays. She's also addicted to Starbucks lattes, expensive makeup, and super fun parties. But a tiger son born into the family is supposed to make a lot of money and bring honor to his family name. Total sexist bullshit, am I right? Maybe that superstition existed in China in the time of Confucius, but not in 21st century America, where Siri and iPhones practically run our lives. Can I tell you an embarrassing and hideous secret? When I was born, I was covered with thick, abundant hair all over my entire body, like I was an actual tiger cub. According to my parents, I even had coarse hairs growing on my chin, forehead, and cheeks. My mom likes to joke that I looked exactly like a hairball spat out by a designer cat. My dad says that two weeks before I was born, he dreamed that my mom had given birth to a tiger cub, but he's deeply superstitious. He's a kind of guy who checks with a feng shui master, before buying a painting for the house, 
or making a new friend. My dad is born in the year of the goat. So he believes that anyone who isn't a farm animal, like his tiger daughter, i.e. me, brings him bad luck. Before he could propose to my mom, who is a zodiac dog, he consulted the Chinese almanac. Then he hired a Chinese monk to work out the math and interview his future bride. When my mom told him she was going to give birth to a tiger, he's extremely worried. A dog and goat for parents are no match for a tiger, he exclaimed. When he found out that his tiger cub was going to be a girl, I think he actually cried from anxiety. Anyway, I was lucky that a lot of my facial hair fell off by kindergarten, but it doesn't explain the gross, extremely long, mustache-like hairs that sometimes appear when I'm super stressed. These hairs sprout above my upper lip and even grow out of my ears. I swear, those hairs are like my whiskers. Thank God for the invention of hair wax and affordable laser treatment. Without deluxe near wax ready strips, I don't think I could ever be seen in public during times of great personal duress. That, and I have to blame my bad luck on my sometimes too loving, overprotective parents. As soon as I was born, they told me a famous fortune teller who was visiting from China to ask her how to fix my life trajectory. It all went wrong from the very beginning. You see, the fortune teller, Madam Singh, found a funny shaped mole under my right eye and said it looked like a teardrop, like I was born to be permanently crying. This flower heart is no good, she announced my parents. After a quick examination, my mom and dad were probably horrified and praying that they could send me back to the hospital and switch me for a tiger boy. It also didn't help. That was one of those babies who was always crying and puking everywhere. My mom said I just barfed a Madame Zing's mink fur and she got flustered and started cussing nonstop. My dad swears that this was bad luck as it offended a powerful fortune teller who must have put a double curse on me. After our first and only fortune telling session, Madame Zing cryptically said, keep both eyes on your tiger daughter. If you take one eye off, she will bring shame on your family with her weak flower heart. Whatever she said was true. Since I was born, I guess I was destined to be a flower heart. I have a weakness for terrible choices and terrible boys. This brings me to my current situation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lindsay. Um, okay, so we have uh, some time for questions. Um, you can type those into the chat on your YouTube stream, um, and then they will be communicated to me uh, to ask. So while we wait for those to come in, I have a question um, for both of you. I'm wondering if you can speak to the um, survivalist mentality of immigrant families as kind of um, or how that meets up with the unwillingness to acknowledge mental illness or, or, or hesitancy to, um, to treat mental illness. Did you want to? Uh, no, I didn't really know. Okay. Um, I think with, um, especially in Chinese culture, um, there is this, idea of you know mental illness not existing the idea that you know survival comes first right so as mm -hmm. long as you know if you have you know trauma and poverty you're focused on feeding yourself and you're not really thinking about the effect on your mind um i think um so a lot of families who come from asia who have that sort of upbringing um they are um they're suddenly you know you have enough now in this new country but at the same time it's at a scarcity thinking, the idea that we will never have enough, you know, we have to keep hoarding, we have to keep, you know, saving up, right? And it, it is that trauma that you can't escape from. I think a lot of it also has to do with the fact that um, Asian cultures are collectivist. Um, yeah. uh, as a whole, the encouragement is to think about the community, the family, parents, filial piety, as opposed to being more introspective about what's going on individually. Um, and I think that kind of 
ends up where people are not um, where people are not open to hearing about individual problems, but also people are not used to uh, introspection enough to to uh, acknowledge that there is a problem. Mm -hmm. I think there's definitely not a sense of the I in in um, Asian culture. It's all about we and and thinking about your family and thinking about what is best for the group for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that for coming from an individualist uh, culture and society, understanding that collectivist mindset is very important for for understanding other cultures and and seeing the differences in their in their function. Um, thank you. Okay, so we have a question. Uh, I really want to know if Lindsay's parents have read her book and or what feedback she's received from her family. Oh, well, no, my family has not read my book yet. So um, I, I keep uh, telling the story, um, you know, about the library and how, you know, they spent too much money on me already. So I guess, you know, I mean, I'm sh my brother says they have, but no one has given me feedback about it. Um, I guess we won't, we won't talk about that because that's my family. We, we don't talk about things that are uncomfortable. Um, let's talk about inspiration. What inspires you guys to write? Um, I can take this one. So I was in a workshop on how to write rom-coms. At the time I was trying to write uh, still romances, but a bit more serious. Um, so I w went to a workshop on how to write rom-coms and after the instructor did the whole day of lessons on how to do it, she put us all, um, she made us all work individually to come up with a premise for a rom-com. And I actually wrote in my notes about an engineer who comes home to finish her thesis at home and discovers that her grandmother has rented the basement out to a barbershop quartet. So I came up with the premise just like that in, in this workshop and then I decided to write it, which was pretty loopy, um, but it turned out well, so I'm happy. Lindsay? Uh, for me, um, I'm always just writing stories for myself. Um, uh, when I was growing up, there wasn't a lot of Asian representation and I didn't see myself reflected in YA literature or even, you know, memoirs. Um, you know, there was a like, very few. Um, so I think for me, I, it's all about just trying different genres and, you know, just basically seeing like what I can do with, you know, different genres and Asian representation. Um, Along with your uh, trying new genres, uh, how much did you love writing YA and do you want to write more? Yeah, it was really, really fun. Um, I always tell people that, you know, don't write a memoir unless you really have to. Um, memoir is really hard. It's, um, it's not fun, but it's like something that is very necessary. Whereas like YA I felt was very freeing. So mm -hmm. I'm definitely going to be doing some more fiction in the future. Vera, are you interested in in looking into nonfiction? Oh, I have never, I've never actually thought about that. Um, I don't, I don't know if I would write narrative non. Definitely, I wouldn't write anything other than narrative nonfiction if I was to go into uh, nonfiction because I like the storytelling aspect mm -hmm. of it. Um, but I'm not sure. Um, I, I hate to say that I'm not interesting enough, but <laughs> I'm just not sure if I would ever go that route. Maybe. Maybe in 10 years, I'll write a narrative nonfiction about writing rom-coms. Yeah, I read that. <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, do you find that because you're incorporating so much of your cultural upbringing into your fiction that it kind of feels a little bit biographical? Actually, yeah, very much so. Um, so the book that I have coming out next, um, if you combine Amira in The Chai Factor and Rena in that book, um, you might get me. So it's really neat to write fiction and put parts of me in different books. Mm -hmm. um, I've had a lot of careers before I became a writer. Um, and I, I find it really fun to uh, to write those careers as as the person's job in the book, because then I can take that that part of me and put it in there and that part of me and put it in there. And also the cultures, the family structure. Um, a lot of my upbringing is there. And then also my setting. I like to write in Toronto and I've always lived here.
Um, you guys live in like our two most major cities, uh, Vancouver and Toronto. Um, they are geographically much different in that Toronto. They're kind of like our New York and LA where it's like your Vancouver is very spread out and um, not as concentrated as, as Toronto. How do you, how do you feel like that shapes the setting like, or informs, because I'm sorry, uh, Lindsay, is your YA novel set in, in a Vancouver like city? It's actually, it's set a little bit in New Jersey and then the teen is sent to Beijing. So it's, it's right. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. How do you, how do you guys work with setting coming from where you are? Um, so I, the, yeah, fair. Sorry. Answer. Uh, I like setting, um, I mean, obviously familiarity, but uh, I like setting my books in Canada. Um, my next publisher is actually an American publisher and I, and I had assumed that they would ask me to change the setting, but they were like, no, no, set it in Toronto if you want. Because I think we need, I think the rest of the world needs a little bit more um, to see what it's like here. Toronto especially doesn't feel like other cities I've been to. Um, the diversity is a big part of it. And like you said, it's very close. Like everything is, not, it's like a giant small town. Um, we're very packed into small areas and everything's crowded and you can get food from any country in the world here. So it's a very unique place. And I feel like if I were to set my story somewhere else, I would be like pigeonholing some parts in, into there as opposed to this feels organic to the kind of stories I'm telling. Mm -hmm. Lindsay? Yeah, I also write a lot about immigrants and you know, Vancouver is um, a large immigrant city, especially with you know Asian immigrants and Chinese Canadians. Um, so the, with the woo-woo, um, it mostly took place in Vancouver growing up in the suburbs. Um, I think for me, I'm, I'm all about trying different locations and, you know, seeing what works for a story. Um, but I would actually love to, to live in the East Coast. I mean, I lived in New York before, but I don't know, Toronto sounds amazing. So yeah, maybe my next story will take place in Toronto. Um, you graduated from Columbia, I read, yes? Mm -hmm. What did you take there? Sorry? What did you take there? Um, I studied uh, creative nonfiction. That's so cool. How was it being like living in New York? I really liked it, um, but that I, I was mostly sick during my graduate study, so I didn't get to really explore. Um, so I saw, I saw a lot of hospitals and I saw a lot of doctors. So oh, sorry. I probably write an essay about living, um, yeah, about all the, you know, the, about the American healthcare system. But, um, but no, I, I really love New York. I love being among people and I love like the literary culture. I think in Canada, because we're all so spread out, you know, um, having festivals is so amazing that you get to actually, you know, meet other authors and read readers. Um, Farah, in the Chai Factor, how did you want to present Amira to young women today as a brown woman in STEM who has a variety of obstacles to face in her field? So one of the things that was really important for me with Amira is um, she comes off as a little, um, people have called her an unlikable heroine, which I find weird because I think she's very likable, but she's very strong-willed. Um, she's stubborn. She is not someone to play nice. Um, she doesn't get along with people she doesn't know very well, that, that well, but once she knows you, she is eternally loyal. Um, and for me, that was really important. Um, it was really important for me to write a, a South Asian Muslim character that kind of went against the stereotype of what um, an Asian woman is usually uh, submissive, usually kind of meek and shy. Um, Amira has a reason for being brash a lot of time, um, but I really wanted her to um, fight back against the world that is right now annoying her to no end. Um, she doesn't just take it, she fights back. Uh, and I think that was one of the things that I wanted to do for other Asian women that would read it and kind of give the idea that, first of all, if you are unlikable. Um, you are also still entitled to a happily ever after and still entitled to a, to a nice, joyful, big, shiny romance. Um, but also that it's okay to be angry at the world and it's okay to sometimes snap at people. And that doesn't mean that you are not a good person inside. I love that. Um, 
a member from the audience is curious what you guys are working on now. Uh, I'm in copy edits for my next book. <laughs> so I'm, I'm engrossed in it. We're starting promotional activities soon too. That's exciting. Yes. I've been working on another way um, with a teen who's OCD. Um, so I've been doing that. And then I have a collection of immigrant horror stories that I've sort of been revising. So it's kind of weird, but we'll see what happens with it. I would love to read that. That sounds like, because I really love horror, and that sounds like a, a an angle of the genre that I, I would find really wonderful. Um, Lindsay, do you ever think about writing a novel based on your undergrad YA thesis about AAA female ice hockey? Yeah, um, I thought about that. I mean, that was um, something I was working on in undergrad, but um, after I put it away, I came back to it and I was like, oh, the writing is really bad, but I like, I like the idea. Um, yeah, I think a hockey novel would be really fun, especially with like Asian characters. Um, I think uh, I really like your point, Farah, about how like Asian characters are always seen, um, especially if they're like angry or strong, they're always seen as unlikable. And I think we need more characters like that. Definitely. Mm -hmm. I, so to the, uh, like the hockey narrative is so inherently Canadian. And so incorporating diverse um, characters into that narrative would be really valuable, I think, for a lot of readers. Um, okay, also a big theme for both of you seems to be humor. Is this intentional and deliberate? Um, and how does culture interconnect with humor? It's an excellent question. <laughs> yeah, no, that's a good question. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard because I think um, if you are like a naturally, I guess, a comedic person or you see the absurdity in a situation, it's sort of, I don't want to say easy to transpose on the page, but it just feels really natural mm -hmm. to write a comedic situation. Um, I know with Woo Woo, because um, so much of the stuff is really dark and, and happy, um, I definitely did have to, you know, see it from my point of view, which was, and infuse it with like comedy. Um, I know with my YA, um, I knew that I wanted to write something fun and and for me, something fun it would have a lot of humor in it. Yeah, I think I think what you're saying is exactly right. If you are the type of person to find humor in the world, then it's not um, it's not hard to to put it in your work. It's funny the uh, I said that that Chai Factor was the easiest book I ever wrote. It was also the first time I actually tried to write something funny. And maybe that's why it was so much easier is I just kind of, okay, lower all inhibitions and put it all in there. And it just came out smoother than other things I'd tried. Yeah, and I think when you're writing um, about things that you and your family have experienced, like what is it, comedy is tragedy plus time. Like it's it just becomes very natural to kind of uh, like put it in that light and under that veil um i always like when things are serious and comedic at the same time a great combination oh uh somebody is wondering if your books are available in audio format mine is not no mine are um audible has it um the woo woo is by it's narrated by eunice wong and she's amazing um she's also canadian and then the, my summer of love and misfortune is narrated by Nancy Wu, and she's really really funny. So, yeah, I recommend both of them an audiobook. Um, I don't know if you guys have heard of the site LibriVox, but if somebody wants to take on the uh, narrating of the uh, Chai Factory, it could become an audiobook. Yes. Okay. I think that that, if there are no more questions, I think we're going to wrap it up. Um, did you, either of you guys have final words or plugs or anything that you wanted to say? No, I don't think so. Thank you for the thoughtful questions. They were great. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you so much really for good. hanging out with us today.
Okay, um, that is going to be all for me. Um, thank you guys so much for joining us today. Um, this has been a, a sheer delight. Um, let's give our authors another silent round of applause. Yay. Um, over to you, Edmund.